Okay, we're in session 15 of 24, exploring the book of Genesis. But we also have crossed a threshold here. We have, we're entering a whole different section. We're, uh, chapter uh, 12 deals with the call of Abraham. And uh, we're going to take chapters 12 through 15. That sounds ambitious, but you'll see why. It flows pretty easily. We're going to have a whole different style here. We've, we have budgeted the first dozen for the first 11 chapters of Genesis with eight different sessions just on the creation week. We did that deliberately. But you got a lot of physics and particle physics and all of that, and that's fine because it lays a foundation that's essential for everything, not just the book of Genesis. But at this point, you can regard everything that's gone on so far, the first 11 chapters of the book, as a preface or background, not just for the book of Genesis, but the whole Old Testament. So we've really been laying a, a very uh, basic foundation in the misty uh, times of what they call prehistory. But now we're shifting gears. The whole thing is going to focus on a guy that's essential for both of us, a guy by the name of Abraham, not just for Jews, for Gentiles too. So um, as I say, the first 11 chapters right up to the Tower of Babel were uh, uh, a prelude. We're now at what most uh, commentators would split in the second section, the last half of the book. And we'll have, a, a about, a, you know, we'll have a, about nine chapters on Abraham, and then we'll have about five on, uh, or six on uh, Isaac, then Jacob, and then Joseph, and uh, the patriarchs. And that will round out the book. It'll be the bulk of the book, but it'll flow because it's really largely narrative with some comments as we go. So we're going from chapter 11 now to chapter 12 through 20. And uh, I'm going to get that out of there. You may recall, we'll start this in a sense with the last few verses of chapter 11 by way of review. We, we went through the, ten nation, the uh, uh, table of nations, the ten, uh, chapter 10 of Genesis, which has 70 nations defined. But when we got to Shem, and, in, and of course they're broken down by the three sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Shem being the critical one from a biblical point of view. But you remember his sons were Elam, Asher, and Arphaxed. And Arphaxed had Selah, and who, who in turn had Eber, and Peleg, and in this case, this chapter is going to add to that and focus where we're headed. But we also had Joktan and some others. Um, but the point is, is in Genesis um, chapter 11 uh, and 18 following, we have the forebears that bring you from Shem, the son of Noah, all the way down to Abraham. Abraham is the pivot. He's a very, very unusual guy. Now, something else you're going to notice when we were talking about Adam, Seth, even Noah, these people aren't very real to us, I don't think. At least I feel that way. You, we know them intellectually. We lo know a little bit about them. But we don't know enough about them to really feel. Uh, we know what they're like. They're, they're abstractions. They're intellectual thoughts. They're not live people. Uh, when you get to Abraham, it's going to start shifting because he's going to be very, we know a lot about him. And... Uh, there's all kinds of reasons we will relate to Abraham. So we're going to see a whole different style. Looking at it from a timeline point of view, we've been through the creation, the fall of man, through the flood, and now we're in the time of Abraham, which, of course, the, is a prelude to the whole issue of the nation Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his 12 sons go down to Egypt as a family by the end of the book. But Exodus, then, they come out as a nation. So the birth of the nation... Uh, specifically is the book that follows Genesis. And that, of course, leads to the monarchy and all of that. And so, okay. The call of Abraham we're going to deal with. He will separate from his nephew Lot. There's a very important battle of nine kings that gives rise to the most, one of the most mysterious personages in the Old Testament, a strange character by the name of Melchizedek. We'll talk about that. And then, of course, the combination of the call of Abraham in chapter 12 along with the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant in chapter 15, is absolutely essential for every one of us to understand. The tragedy in the Christian church is probably 9 out of 10 churches have no grasp of what the Abrahamic covenant means to them. They have no real foundation in the Old Testament. And that's tragic because every blessing you and I enjoy as Gentiles derive from Abraham and the covenant that God made with him. So we really want to understand that for two reasons. It's important to every one of us personally. Secondly, it is the challenge of the world today. 
that not just the PLO, but the European Union, the UN, are all, are all uh, aggressively, desperately challenging the covenant that God made with Abraham. You need to understand that. And you need to have the, you know, understand that foundation. Abraham's an interesting guy. He is mentioned 74 times in the New Testament. And uh, that's, uh, 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 and there, by some reckoning, by the way, there's about a six decade overlap with Noah. That shocks many people. Something you can do with your Bible is lay out the births of these guys and how, and, how, and, and when they died and when they had gave birth to their sons and lay that all out. And you'll be astonished at the overlaps. Uh, that uh, so many of these, many of these, this background could have been conveyed uh, person to person, uh, not passed down through gener many, many generations, as many as people like to think sometimes. Abraham's unique in another way. He is venerated by the three major religions on the planet Earth, obviously by Judaism and obviously by Christianity, but also by Islam. It's one of the few places where there's some commonality. I say it guardedly because it's, uh, Islam has a strange twist on a lot of things, but they do. Uh, they would claim high veneration of uh, Abraham. And uh, now Abraham also goes by some very distinctive titles. Tells you a lot about the guy. He is known as the father of the faithful. Everyone that has faith in God can be, it can be considered linked to Abraham. Hebrews 11 verse 8 deals with some of that. He also has another expression that I think will turn out to be surprisingly instructive. He is known as the friend of God. If you ask somebody that's biblically literate who was the friend of God, they'll say right away, Abraham. That's a distinctive title. Not that God didn't have other friends, but that's a term that is uniquely to him. And James in chapter 2 uses it specifically, and it's alluded to in a couple of other contexts. But I want to show you something else that I, I get fascinated with because I regard it as evidence of design. Abraham is called a friend of God, and uh, there's, some, there's another group that are called the friends of God. Do you remember in James 2, of course, and in Genesis 18, verse 17, we have Abraham as a friend of God. In fact, God uses, is he not my friend? Should I not tell him what I'm going to do? And in Genesis 18, he shares with Abraham what's going to happen um, in Sodom and Gomorrah the next day. In Genesis 19, there's the, the destruction, of course, of Sodom and Gomorrah. But what's interesting there, you'll find linked the idea that he's a God's friend with prophetic insight. Because he's God's friend, God gives him some special insight. In fact, they end up with a very, very amusing negotiation going on. We'll deal with that when we get there. But I want to notice something else. Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, you're no longer my servants, you're now my friends. Remember that? John 15, that famous intimate time up in the upper room. But then he also links that to letting them know what he's going to do. And uh, now, let's go take that one step further. Who in the Old Testament was known as the beloved prophet? Anyone? No, not the Old Testament. Daniel. Daniel, the greatly beloved, and so forth. Okay. Who, you're right. Who was the disciple that is singled out as the one that Jesus especially loved? John. He consigned his mother to his care, not as, not as blood brothers, but Apostle John, right? What's interesting is the term beloved also seems to link with what I'll call apocalyptic privilege. Daniel was the beloved prophet. He's also the one that had the most apocalyptic visions from Daniel 7 through 12, all those, 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 those six chapters. John was the beloved disciple who wrote the most apocalyptic book of the Old Testament, or the New Testament. John, the book of Revelation. So it's interesting, you'll notice that these terms carry with them certain connotations, and what's interesting, you'll find there's a consistency. And the reason I get interested in this is because I, I regard this as uh, uh, evidence of design. I'm going to show you some other places in this lesson that we'll find the, the New Testament's in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. It's one book. As you, most of you know, but I'll just put it on, on the record, if you will. Our ministry is based on two discoveries. The first is that these 66 books are an integrated message. Even though penned by over 40 guys over thousands of years, they bear evidence of an integrity of design that's astonishing. And I don't mean just thematically. I'm talking about structure. I'm talking about every number, every place name being there by skillful craftsmanship. 
The second discovery that derives from that, of course, is that the origin of this message had to come from outside our time domain. So as we go, you'll find me trying to highlight that. Something else I'm going to suggest we do as we go. We've shifted into this different section, from Genesis section 1 to section 2. As we move into section 2, I want you to turn your antenna up on parallels, types, secondary meanings. You're going to discover that Jesus Christ will appear in one way or another on every page. We won't beat that to death. There's going to be plenty just by hitting the highlights. But your challenge is to, as you read your Bible, pay attention to the fact that it was engineered for more than just the narrative. There are other lessons that derive from it. And so um, now Abraham, of course, we're going to talk about he, he entered into or was the pet beneficiary of an everlasting covenant, the fact that it's eternal, unconditional, we'll get into. Very, very crucial for all of us. We're also going to discover that Abraham's life is a struggle between the flesh and the spirit. The same struggle you and I have, we'll see dramatized in the life of Abraham. And by the way, something else, his name, until we get to chapter 17, is Abraham. It gets changed to Abraham. And I'm not academically disciplined enough to try to always use Abraham. So I'll say Abraham. You need to understand I'm sort of looking ahead. His, his name at this stage is Abraham. And I'll explain the difference. The difference may surprise you uh, when we get there. We're gonna, I want you to see the struggle between the flesh and the spirit in his personal life. You're also going to see it dramatized between Ishmael and Isaac. In fact, the epistle writers of the New Testament will treat it that way as not, as, as, as a... a in, a, in an allegorical sense. And uh, same thing with Sarah and Hagar, the, 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 the wife and the, and the, uh, the, the substitutionary wife, if you will, uh, that uh, shows up. And, and Paul in his letter to Galatians, chapter 4, will emphasize that. We'll deal with it when we get to the chapter 16 in Genesis. I also want you to be sensitive to the strange lessons that derive from this guy called Melchizedek. Who was he? What was all that about? He was the king and priest of the Most High. That punctures all our little rules. I thought the priesthood and the kingship were separated. Levi and Judah, never, they would always be separate. Here's a guy that is a king and a priest. What does that really mean? He, he shows up for a few verses in chapter 14, and he would disappear to oblivion except for Psalm 110, three chapters in the book of Hebrews, it turns out it's very important that we understand what that's all about. And, of course, the climax for Abraham in many ways for most of us will be the Akedah, this bizarre episode on Mount Moriah where he offers Isaac. And what is that all about? Is God teaching us to child sacrifice? I don't think so, but we'll deal with that when we get there. Probably my favorite chapter in prophecy is Genesis 22, but let's move on. Genesis 12, Abraham's father, we're really, in effect, picking up from the last few verses of chapter 11, Terah had three sons that we know of, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. He also had a daughter by a second wife. His first wife apparently died. He had another wife. And he, uh, he had a daughter by her by the name of Sarai. And uh, now Sarah will marry Abraham. And we'll find Abraham, for his own survival, will pass her off as his sister. He's not lying. That's technically true. It's one of these places where you can be accurate and still lying. <laughs> that he, and he wasn't a politician. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, so Abraham will marry Sarah, and from that, ish, uh, from that relationship, he had, of course, Ishmael. And I, uh, I should say, not through that relationship with Hagar. We'll get into that. But anyway, Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. We'll get to all that. Nahor has a group of sons, Bethuel, Uz, Buzz, sounds like a rock group, doesn't it? <laughs> Kemuel, Kesed, Hazo, Bildash, and Jadlaf. But the important one for us, well, it will be Bethuel for some reasons. Haran had uh, Milcah as a daughter, uh, Iska, and Lot as children. And now Lot turns out to be important to understand. He was in it technically, he was Abraham's nephew. And they're going, to be op they're going to be hanging out together for a while, but they're going to be opposites in the way they deal with things. And they're very instructive. Uh, Abraham will distinguish himself by walking by faith. Lot walks like the rest of us do, and uh, we'll learn something from Lot. Uh, Bethuel has, two, uh, has a daughter by the name of Rebekah and a son by the name of Laban. 
They're both going to figure prominently in the episodes that follow. Rebecca marries Isaac. We'll talk a lot about that when the time comes. And of course, from that issue, we have two sons, Esau and Jacob. And Esau was the firstborn, but Jacob snookers him out of the right of the firstborn. And uh, we'll deal with all of that. And uh, Laban has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. And uh, through some very complex relationships, they end up marrying Jacob. And from the two of them, plus their handmaids, they end up bringing forth the 12 tribes. That's the family of Terah. I, put it, I, I uh, indulge the chart, primarily give you some feeling for these relationships because the relationship between Am, uh, Abraham and Sarai is part of it. Isaac and Rebekah, see he's marrying into the family in a sense. And uh, Jacob and Leah and Rachel all fit together. And of course, Lot and Abraham, you see how they'll, uh, that's going to be important to understand as we go. And uh, now Lot has um, uh, daughters, and they, um, through incest, uh, contrive, in effect, the offspring of Moab and Ammon. So the Moabites and the Ammonites have the um, stigma of being the results of incest with Lot. And uh, so we'll get to that when the time comes. Okay, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I'll make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Three very important verses, verses 2 and 3 are the primary hope of America, among other things. Everybody asks me, why hasn't God judged America? Billy Graham quipped many years ago, saying that if God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. This country is overdue for God's judgment for lots of reasons. The mystery that everybody asks me about is why hasn't God judged America already? And I personally suspect that it's because of Genesis 2 and 3, because of our support of Israel. But that won't stay. That's going to erode away, and uh, Israel will have to stand alone. That's part of her destiny. But I want to get back to verse 1. You know, so many people have this impression that Abraham was flawless as a man of faith. And most people haven't uh, done the homework. In fact, I'd say 9 out of 10 commentaries you'll check will miss what I'm about to try to show you. I'm going to introduce you to a commentary that's probably better than any that you'll buy in a bookstore. And that's one by a young man, a very young guy relatively new Christian, a guy by the name of Stephen. And this young man had the audacity, in Hebrew they'd say the chutzpah. <laughs> you know what chutzpah is. There are books written about chutzpah. Chutzpah is when a guy kills his mother and father and then throws himself on the mercy of the court because he's an orphan. That's chutzpah. <laughs> uh, there, isn't, there isn't a comparable word in other languages, but in any case, this young man had the brass, if I can put it that way, to give a Old Testament Bible study to the most, the most august Jewish council of the time, the Sanhedrin. And you'll find that in Acts chapter 7. And by the way, one of the fun things to do sometime is just study Acts 7 and make a list of the things that he reveals there you cannot find elsewhere in the Bible. There's three or four things that are startling that come out of his insights that are really quite fun. But I want to just take you to Acts chapter 7, verse 2 through 4. Visualize this young man, and he's reviewing the Old Testament in front of the, in this court hearing, in effect. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Really? Mesopotamia, by the way, means between the rivers. That's what the word means. And it's that region between the Tigris and the Euphrates. It's a strip of land that we associate mostly with Iraq and Syria, up to into Syria. And, he, and, and said unto, God said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And Stephen goes on to make his lecture, which goes on for quite a while. By the way, another little footnote for those of you that want an extra credit assignment. Take Stephen's address and outline it. And recognize he was interrupted. They didn't let him finish. From his outline, 
can you t figure out what he was going, where he was headed and what he was going to say before they interrupted him? I'll give you a clue, but you verify it through your own study. He goes through, and goes through the history of Israel, how they always blew it the first time, but made it on the second. Blew it the first time, made it on the second. And they didn't recognize their Messiah on his first coming. And they get so upset, they take out and stone him, right? Where was he headed? They're gonna, they blew it in the first time, they'll get it on the second. And you can, feel, you can build that from Old Testament prophecy. But it's interesting, the young man apparently was heading in that direction before he got cut off. Um, anyway, he tells us some things here. He says that the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And he was told to get out of the country, and from the, out of his kindred, and come into the land which God is going to show him. And he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, and he dwelt in Haran. Well, Haran is not in Canaan. So let's take a look at what this all means. See, he was before he dwelt in Haran. Now, understand, this is a map. You can see uh, right about in the middle, I put Babylon, not because uh, as a frame of reference for you from our previous studies, but, um, oh, a couple of hundred miles, uh, about a hundred miles or so to the uh, southeast is a place called Ur. It's one of the oldest regions on the planet Earth from a civilized point of view, the Ur of the Chaldees. See, that's almost at the, at the Persian Gulf. So that's maybe 100 miles from there. Haran, well, first of all, God told Abraham to get out of his, out of his country, away from his kindred, right? And God told him that when he was in Ur. What did Abraham do? He moved up river. He moved up to Haran. Haran is north of Damascus. Nowhere near Canaan, by the way. And he's in Haran. When his father finally dies, then he picks up and does what God told him to do. So you could make a case. There's probably five years of time up there in Haran. And uh, you could make a case. You say, gee, he was, he, that wasn't a faith. He didn't really do what God told him to do at first. But, uh, you know, it's interesting. You can't find that in the text directly. Why? What does God promise you about your sins? They'll be remembered no more. And that may sound like double talk, but uh, um, see, what, now, we, now we'll reread Genesis 12, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham. See, back when they were down there, he was supposed to leave down there, I, would, I, 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 I infer. Leave his father, leave his family. That's what God called him out of. He didn't do that. He just moved up river with all of them for about five years until his father died. Now, there may have been some extenuating circumstances. Maybe there was illness. Who knows? But in any case, it wasn't until his father dies that he then obeys. And God credits his obedience, even though from our point of view, it may have been a little dilatory. God had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I, then God gives him his, the, the, these famous I wills. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. Make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. By the way, it's astonishing to realize how the rise and fall of nations relate to the treatment of Israel. And uh, there are some interesting books that have been written on that. It's absolutely amazing how, um, how that, that goes, and even, even in relatively modern times. It wasn't that long ago that they shepherded Jews into ghettos, put walls around them, and machine gunned anyone that was climbing over that wall. A few years later, there were walls around Berlin, and Germans were a machine gun for climbing over that wall, until... Rudolf Hess, the last survivor of that leadership, died in Spandau Prison. When he died, that wall came down. But you can go on. There, there people have, some authors have treated this uh, rather interesting. Seven I wills. God says, I will make of thee a great nation, the nation of Israel, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in these shall all families, not just Jews, all families of the earth be blessed. Every benefit you and I have in Jesus Christ derives from this covenant relationship, surprisingly enough. 
And the important issues for us to realize is that contract is still intact. And when we mess around in the Middle East, we inadvertently are poking our finger in the eye of God. God has put his name on that particular parcel of ground. He has a destiny for it. He has a plan for it. And we jeopardize ourselves by not recognizing that. The nations are going to be judged on this basis, according to Matthew 25, 31 through 46. The great white throne judgment. This Abrahamic covenant foresees the blessing of the family of the entire earth, and Paul develops that in Galatians chapter 3. And it, it's going to be a, a part of the aspects before the throne of God in Revelation 5. But let's move on. Verse 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. His nephew went with him. And Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And unto the land of Canaan they came. And uh, now to give you a perspective, they're up in Haran. So now they're migrating downward, south westward, westerly direction into the land of Canaan. And I haven't bothered to get into the specifics of Canaan. We'll do that on a subsequent review. But Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, or Sikkim is here, or Shechem, same place, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. We're going to talk a lot about him before it's over, the Canaanites in general. Most people who read their Bible do not really understand what the Canaanites were really all about. We'll come to that when we get there. The Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. One of the things you can do in your notes is keep track of Abraham building altars. Every place he goes, not every place, but frequently, frequently he builds altars. And he's an example to all of us. <laughs> if you'll excuse a, a pun, we all need altered lives. You see? And I, I, I'm, I mean in terms of, place of wor places of worship. It's, I will give him this land and there build an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence into a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going on still, toward the south. And uh, it's interesting, there were no altars in uh, Ur or Haran. This is part of his trek. This is part of his calling. He didn't have altars before. He and Terah, by the way, and the whole family were idol-worshiping Gentiles. They were pagans. God called Abraham out of all of that. One of the symbols you're going to find here in Abraham's life, but it's a very poignant symbol to really understand, and that's a tent. The tent is, and you could just say, well, that's a cultural thing. No, the tent is a temporary residence. He's sojourning. He's not, he's not, he's not establishing a permanent place. His eye is on the city whose builder and maker is whom? God, exactly. And uh, so the tent is his emblem. Um, we must, you and I are also called to be strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You have to do that before acceptable worship is possible. It's interesting when you study the book of Revelation, there are two kinds of people there, the saved, the saints, the, those, and the earth dwellers, those that dwell on the earth. And it doesn't mean just that they're physically there. They dwell on the earth. The earth's their home. That's where their commitments are. That's where their priorities are. That's where their heart is. That's what's implied by the whole thing. And so you want to be sensitive to that contrast, not only here in Genesis, but also in Revelation. Anyway, Abraham continues to journey to the south. Uh-oh. And there was a famine in the land. And Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. You and I don't have any idea what that's like. None of us have been that hungry. But these, these were not avoidable. They were serious. And uh, um, so Abram went down into Egypt. Now, if you just read this naively to begin with, you figure, well, that's natural. That's what he should have done. I mean, you know, that's, it, uh, Egypt had, had the Nile, had a, a, a more reliable source of grain, so it was, uh, it was uh, a natural thing for him to do. But you'll also discover as you read your Bible that Egypt is used idiomatically to represent the world. World. And... Uh, Isaiah 31.1 says, Woe unto them that go down to Egypt for help. 
and, uh, and so forth. In other words, to do that instead of trusting on the Lord. Many commentators are pretty hard on Abram for going down there. I'm not sure where I stand on that. I, I suspect that it was just plain pragmatics to do this, and yet it does lead to all kinds of problems. I don't know what his alternatives really were. And trust the Lord, of course. And it came to pass when he was come near to, the, to enter into Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, <laughs> Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. And boy, when you read the book of Genesis, the more you learn about Sarah, the more you can defend the view she must have been really unusually attractive for lots of reasons. She was quite a gal, apparently. But in any case, he's nervous because, he, he's a, because of, he's, she's so attractive, that's going to breed trouble for him. He says, therefore, there, therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife, and they shall kill me. But they will save thee alive. Now, so, and, and so say, I pray thee, that thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. So that's his stratagem. By the way, he doesn't do it just here. He does it three times. This was his policy. You'll find it in verse 13. You'll find it in chapter 20, verse 2, and chapter 26, verse 7. And in the second instance, he even explains that this was his policy. Pretty, pretty uh, serious stuff. So it is possible to be accurate and yet untrue. And uh, journalists are like that, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Now, she actually was, he was, it wasn't a lie. She was his half-sister. Chapter 20, verse 12 will emphasize that. And, uh, but he just conveyed to the Egyptians all he wanted them to know. You see, in that, in that society, in enemy territory, a husband could be taken, killed, the wife considered uh, 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 you know, uh, a prize. And, uh, but if Abraham was her brother they would have to negotiate with him for her marriage. It would give him a second line of retreat, if you will. And so it, it, it sounds a little weird to us, but it's, it's in, under the context of the situation, it is an understandable strategy on his part, although it is less than truthful. And uh, so the princes also Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. See, something that Abraham may not have counted on, she not only attracted the Egyptian's eye right up to the top, before, brought her, commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, that is, into his harem and so forth. And he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and asses and men servants and maid servants and, and she asses and camels and so forth. So Abraham has scored. He's really well treated. But he has, he, 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 he's got <laughs> he's to be vexed over this situation. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. You need to understand that if Sarah doesn't survive this relationship, God's promises to Abraham won't be. God has an equity here. And God's supernatural intervention is, going, is the only thing that's going to save the situation. So these plagues come. That's interesting. These plagues are long before the book of Exodus. I'll show you some parallels in a minute. And Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why dost thou not tell me that she was thy wife? He somehow found out the truth. And he's really upset. And this is messing around with the serious stuff because Pharaoh could have him killed. There's, you know, there's, no, there, <laughs> there's no protections here. He says, Why saidst thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife? Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. Take her and let her go. Why do I visualize Yule Brenner saying that? Yeah, you know? okay. <laughs> and Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, and his wife, oh, and all that he had. So he has to get out of town. He has to leave Egypt, but he leaves with a huge bounty, if you will. Now, I want you to consider... Uh, uh, I'm going to show you some things here, and it's not the substance I'm concerned with. It's just the methodology you might alert yourself as you. Is there a parallel here? There was famine in the land here in Genesis 12, but also in Exodus, remember? The descent into Egypt to sojourn, not to live permanently, but to, to, to endure the, the problems, Genesis 12 and also uh, uh, Genesis 
47. The attempt to kill the males but save the females. The plagues in Egypt, both here in Exodus 7 all the way through to 11. The spoiling of Egypt, not only being kicked out, but taking great bounty with them. Do you see a parallel here? And then the deliverance, both here in Genesis uh, verse 19 and, and also in Exodus 15. And then from there, the ascent into the Negev, or the, to the south. And the parallel here is Genesis 13 and Numbers also 13. So there seems to be, it's almost as if God is not only keeping his promise to Abraham when he protects Israel, but he has, in a sense, you can almost visualize Abraham, maybe obviously unknowingly, acting out in advance the very thing that's going to happen to the nation some substantial, you know, some uh, 400 years later. So let's get anyway to Genesis 13, separation with Lot. Abraham went out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abraham was, when it says the south, by the way, so you don't get confused, the word south in the Hebrew is Negev, the big desert between Egypt and, and Israel is the Negev. It's called the Negev because it's south of Israel, south of Jerusalem. But he's leaving Egypt for the Negev. He's not going south of Egypt. That would take him down to Ethiopia. No, he's, going, he's actually going northeast, you follow me? But it's into the, into the Negev. Okay. Here they've translated the word Negev, which is a proper name, or used as a proper name. It's using it here. It's just in the direction. But anyway, Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. In fact, we're going to discover as we go on that some scholars believe Abraham could well have been the richest man in the world in his day. He is going to have an occasion in chapter 14 to raise up an army out of his own household of 318 trained armed militia. So that's bizarre. You know, he, he's not some little tribal chief with a few tents and some, some donkeys or something. This guy is a major, major player. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. And uh, under the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And again, bear in mind, we're not talking about just a couple of guys and their herds. They all had large uh, servants and, and establishment. The, 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 it was very substantial. There was a strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. Now the Perizzites you find up come up often, they're often usually lumped in with the Canaanites. The word Canaanites sometimes used collectively, sometimes very individually. And, uh, but, uh, so Abraham said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee. And by the way, the word strife there is mirabah. And you may recall, and you get through in the number of when they're wandering in the wilderness, they have contention at Mirabah over water. And in those, when, they, when, they, when they would read this, when a Jew would read this, it would remind him of, you know, there's, in, there's a parallelism continuing here, but let's go on. Uh, and I, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. And uh, so, is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, I'll go to the right. If thou depart to the right, then I will go to the left. You notice that Abraham's approach to this is one of generosity. You pick it. You go where you want to go, and I'll go the other way. But we need to separate for the sake of the flocks and the strife and all that. So Abraham was generous. Lot will turn out to be greedy and worldly all the way through his life. But now, there's a reason that Abraham can be generous. What would that be? Huh? He's got God with him. He also has a prophecy. He knows he's going to be taken care of, right? So Abraham, because he's a man of faith, can afford to be generous. So can we. So can we. I went and looked at the back of the book. We win, you know. <laughs> You know, it's interesting, we don't apply that sometimes. Does our walk in business and elsewhere reflect the fact that we're really of faith? 
Anyway, Lot lifted up his eyes, verse 10, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed. <laughs> this is foot editorial note here. Before the Lord, the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest to Zoar. In other words, that region that we associate as with, with barren, barrenness in those days was like the Garden of Eden. But the editorial comment is that's before Genesis 19 because there's going to be a lot of changes. Most scholars recognize Sodom and Gomorrah at the south end of the Dead Sea. Uh, so there were a lot of changes. that, that we, we have no real grasp of what it was like. It was obviously quite attractive because it was the place that Lot chose as he looked at it from his eyes and so forth. And uh, Lot lifted his eyes. That phrase is a very key phrase you find in the scripture. And uh, it's interesting. I'm going to suggest another conjecture to you. I'm going to suggest to you that the eyes are the portal of Satan. It's our eyes that get us in trouble. It got Eve in trouble when she saw the fruit was to be desired. It got David in trouble when he was looking off his balcony. Uh, the, the young man who saw the Babylonian garment in Joshua 7. You'll notice as you, watch the, you go through scripture, eyes tend to get us in trouble. In contrast to that, the ears seem to be God's portal. Uh, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and by the word, and hearing by the word of God. Uh, in, in the book of Revelation, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches. It doesn't say well, he that hath an eye, let him see what the Spirit, no, it's he that has an ear, let him hear. And it's amazing. Um, I remember reading a paper when I was a teenager along that line. I thought, this guy's kind of wacko. Seemed a little kind of one of these extremists, you know. But as the years have gone by and I study my Bible, I'm beginning to suspect that person who wrote that little paper way back then probably had more perception than I had originally given him credit for. But Lot lifted up his eyes and, of course, gets himself in more trouble here. And uh, David's eyes got into not only the Bathsheba thing, but lost the life of Uriah, lost the dignity of his throne and the honor of his country, and on and on and on. So, so. Uh, and the word, the place Zor, by the way, is a small town that the, they would flee to uh, in chapter 19 when they leave Sodom and Gomorrah. So it'll show up later. Then Lot chose them all the plain of Jordan, and jo Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Pitched his tent toward Sodom. That's not just talking about compass bearings. Is talking about where his heart was, and that's that, that's what he had. That's what he had in mind. That's where he would, you know, uh, constantly check the classified ads and so forth. Whatever. Okay. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And that's probably a huge understatement. It's not. It's not amplified here, but we'll get a very vivid glimpse of that in chapter 19. The Lord said unto Abram after that, Lot was separated from him. Notice, God waits until he's alone. God waits until he's separated. Well, he, doesn't, he wants him separated from these, uh, this baggage, spiritual baggage he's hanging on to. The Lord said unto Abram, after that, Lot was separated from him. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which thou seest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. How long is forever? Till the United Nations get formed and till the Oslo Agreement can be signed? No, no, forever. That is the challenge of the world today. Continuing, God says, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And by the way, God can do that. It's his. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The whole earth, yes, indeed. But there's a particular piece of ground that God has put his name on. And that's the one that's at issue. Every, on the front page of every paper every morning. Hidden there. You'll see that, that that problem is sitting there. We'll get into that more as we go on here. Then Abraham removed his tent and came in and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron about 20 miles or so south of Jerusalem, and built there an altar unto, there's another altar, built there an altar unto the Lord. I want you to notice how Lot's life was going. We're going to talk a lot about Abram. Let's take a quick snapshot of Lot. He first beheld the land, then he chose the land, 
He departed to the land. He dwelt in the plain. He pitched toward Sodom. Then he dwelt in Sodom. And he's finally seated at the gate of Sodom. That is, he's a councilman. So that's his path. Sin does not happen suddenly. It happens in small steps. Small steps. And, uh, and by the way, don't think that David saw Bathsheba for the first time off his balcony. David uh, had a... Uh, uh, anyway, she was a friend of the family. She was a friend of the family. Ahithophel was her grandfather. Anyway, let's move on. Abraham lifted up his eyes. Three times he does it. He saw the land that God promised him. He, he do the same thing when he sees the three visitors coming to him in Genesis 18. Very bizarre chapter. A lot of fun there. And he saw the ram when it was substituted at, on Mount Moriah. When he's about to sacrifice his son. The angel stops him. He lifted up his eyes, saw the substitutionary ram. And we'll get into all of that when time comes. Three key times. Now, Abraham walked by faith. How did Lot walk? By sight. Abraham was generous and magnanimous. Lot was greedy and worldly. Abraham looked for God's city, the city whose builder and maker is the Lord. Lot looked for a, made his home in a city that was destroyed by God. Abraham was the father of all who believed. Lot was tagged with perpetual infamy. And uh, even, even uh, his sons will be from incest with his daughters. Abraham is heir of the world, according to Romans 4. Lot dwelled in a cave and all his possessions were destroyed in Sodom before in chapter 19. We'll see that all come. Well, let's keep moving here. Genesis 14. Let's, they, find, you know, they separate here. came to pass in the days of Amraphel, the king of Shinar, Arioch, the king of Elisar, and uh, Kerdor Laomer, quite a mouthful, king of Elam, and Tidal, the king of nations. These made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, the king of Adma, and Shemeber, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, whatever his name was, and the Bela is Zor, it's the same place. So you've got a group of Hamite kings that are going to be fighting with a group of Shemite kings. If you go through all the rigmarole here to get into this, you'll discover that Shinar, Elam, and those guys, they are all uh, uh, descendants of Shem. And so they're, they're up and east. The others are in Jordan and south, if you will. And uh, so these, all these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served uh, Kedor, Kedor Leomer. And in the 13th year, they rebelled. And Kedor Leomer is not going to put up with that. So we've got a battle of nine kings. There are four kings that are Shemites and five kings that are their subservients uh, that are Hamites, king of Sodom, king of Gomorrah, and a few others. They served, they were indentured to the Shemites for a 12-year period, but on the 13th year they said enough already, and they're at it. And obviously, Shedemar, he, this guy is organized his forces, and he engages the Hamites, succeeds in defeating them, and takes spoil of the, what he regards as the rebels. I won't get into the battle. There's quite a bit of, of, of inferred patterning of how they did this and all this, but it's, it's still conjecture because we're not sure, and it's not that important to the point anyway, except they made a big mistake. They did succeed over the Hamites, but when they took over, that, they took a spoil of Sodom and Gomorrah, they ended up taking as a hostage or as a, as a, as a captive Abraham's nephew. And I'm sure they thought, no problem. They, you know, they didn't obviously think much of it. But Abraham is not one you mess around with. In the 14th year they came, Kedor Laomer and the kings that were with him, and they smote the Rephaims. Now, there's this term, the Rephaims. I want you to pay attention to that word. Most people have no idea what it means. It actually, it, Rephaim is plural. When you see Rephaim is in the plural here, it shows the translators didn't understand. Rephaim itself is plural, but it's, it's the dead in plural. The word actually means the dead ones. If you think of them as the walking dead, you're getting close. They are the Nephilim after the flood. And we'll talk a lot about them in another time, but recognize there are certain tribes that are really 
more bizarre than most people are aware of, and that's why God tells Joshua to wipe out every man, woman, and child of certain groups. They have a gene pool problem. Anyway, the Rephaims and Ashtaroth and Karnaim and the Zunzumims, there's another group of, of, of them in Ham, and the Emims in Sheve Kiriathim. Now, the Emims, the Zunzumims, and the, um, there's a couple of others, are all Rephaims. Rephaim you can look at as a synonym for Nephilim that we talked about in Genesis 6. And uh, spooky, strange stuff, but you will not understand most of the Old Testament and a lot of the prophecies unless you understand what the Rephaim really were. But we'll move into that on in a special time. Let's go on. And the Horites in the Mount Seir under El Paran, which is by the, by the wilderness, and they returned and came to En Mishvat, which is in Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazez on Tamar. Now, we could spend a lot of time trying to make a map, but m most of the experts, it's very conjectural. There's not a, not a lot of certainty as to exactly where some of these places were. They're obviously in that region that we generally would regard as the extended uh, Jordan Valley. And there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, which Bela is a town that's also known as Zor. That's what they keep mentioning. And they joined battle with them in the Vale of Siddim. That might have been in the Kidron Valley, by the way. Some people suspect it might be equivalent to that. And Kedil Armer, the king of Elam. Elam, by the way, is the name for Persia. So when you see this guy... Now, oh, something I meant to point out earlier. When you saw the kings listed, you'll notice the guy that was listed first was the king of Babylon. He wasn't the leader. Third on the list of four was Kedil Armer, who was obviously the leader. Get used to that. The Bible doesn't put things necessarily in chronological order or in the order of what you would think would be important. It's the order that the writer thinks is important. The king of Babylon is going to be far more significant in the future than the other guys. So he's listed first. But I meant to point that out. Anyway, so anyway, Kedil Armer, the king of Alam, and with Tidal, the king of nations, and Amraphel, the king of Shinar, and Arioch, the king of Elisir, four kings with five. But the four guys win. And the veil of Siddim was full of Slime pits, or bitum, on tar. And by the way, from these references, one of the reasons that a lot of people have started to explore the Middle East for oil, because this is obviously a part of the region. Anyway, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abraham the Hebrew. This is the first place the word Hebrew shows up in the scripture. The word probably means, we're not sure, probably means just crossed over, one that crossed over the river. Or it can also simply mean he was a descendant of Eber, which is also in his family tree. There's a lot of, the scholastics debate that, we're not sure. For he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshkol, and the brother Ener, and these were confederate with Abram. So Abram had some confederates. He had made some alliances with some other tribes here. And when Abraham heard that his brother was, and he says, he's using the term brother here broadly, you know, obviously it was a nephew, not literally a brother, but brother in a broad sense, heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants. Now this fascinates me. Here's Abraham. He has a standing army of his own. He armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, <laughs> Boy. and pursued them unto Dan. Dan is a city way up in the north. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them in, unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the woman also, and the people. Here is an army of four kings that just got through defeating five kings and their resources. These are no dummies. But Abraham, with his gang, nailed them. And the people speculate on how he went about it, but it's speculation. There's, there's some hints in the, in the text, but not enough to really formulate a strategy on. The main point is, I think it's God demonstrating the reality of Genesis 12, verse 2 and 3. Uh, God, obviously, God's with Abraham in this whole thing. By the way, one of the cities there, not called Dan, but it was called Laish way back there. We were up there once, and they have found a mud gate from the times of Abraham. Mud, the way they built then is, is, was water-soluble, so they don't last very long. But this particular gate somehow was the subject of a catastrophe, so it was got buried in a very peculiar way. And as they excavated, they realized it's from the time of Abraham. It's, a, not a, it's archaeologically a rather fascinating aspect to it. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return. 
Now see, this is a defeated king, and he's obviously thrilled that Abraham succeeded where he failed. But anyway, King Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedar Laomer and of the kings that were with him at the Valley of Sheva, which is the King's Dale. We think that is the Kidron Valley, by the way, for some reasons. But then we have this peculiar verse, a couple of verses here, that have spawned volumes of speculation. And Melchizedek, by the way, that's a title, not a name. Uh, Melch is a king, and Zedek is righteous. And the word means king of righteousness. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And that's, in effect, Jerusalem, what later becomes Jerusalem. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Really? Bread and wine. This is where it's first. It, remember the law first mentioned. When something's first mentioned, it has profound implications throughout the rest of the Bible. Um, and he was the priest of the Most High God. That's interesting. Now, you realize he's not Jewish. That hasn't even come into being yet. Abraham's just a visitor. In fact, Abraham gives him tithes. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, that's Abraham, gave him tithes of all. Abraham gives him tithes. For you and I, that's an incidental detail. But for the writer of the book of Hebrews, the New Testament, it's a big deal. Because he's going to point out that Levi was in concept, at least, in the loins of Abraham. So by Abraham giving Melchizedek tithes, that means the priesthood of Melchizedek is senior to the Levitical priesthood. And, and that is hammered away in Psalm 110 and in several chapters in the New Testament. Very fundamental idea. And we'll come back to that as we go. The slaughter of the kings. Abraham's army of 318 rescues Lot and, of course, the people of Solomon. Melchizedek, he's a king and a priest. That's bizarre. He receives Abraham's tithes, and Hebrews 6 is going to make a big thing of that. There are allusions to this incident in Psalm 110 and in three chapters of the book of Hebrews. Melchizedek, strange guy. And uh, bread and wine. Before we leave the bread and wine thing, I want you to realize that comes up again with Joseph. When he has these visions, uh, uh, excuse me, he interprets these dreams when he's in prison. And he's got a baker and a wine steward, right? And, and one's killed and one's not. And uh, we find those same elements surface again, of course, uh, not only in the Passover observations, but of course in the Lord's Supper. Bread and wine. So it's interesting. I want you, when you see these things, recognize there's a deliberate theme of craftsmanship going through these 66 books we call the Bible. Melchizedek means the king of righteousness. He was the king of Salem or Jerusalem, and he's also a priest. The fact that he's king and a priest, there's only three people in the Bible that are kings and priests. From Moses on, the kings were out of Judah, and the priests were out of Levi. They were separate tribes, right? By, by God's definitions. So Melchizedek was a king and a priest, and the reason he's so important is that Psalm 110 and, and other promises to Jesus Christ are that he will, his priesthood will be after the order of Melchizedek, not Levi. The Levitical priest was temporary. It was corrupt. It would ha it'd come to an end when the time came. This one is forever. So there's three people, Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, and who's the third? You and I. Second Peter says you are kings and priests if you're in Christ. So by, by, by derivation from Christ, the body of Christ is also has, some, has, has a, a, a rulership aspect to it and also a priestly aspect to it. He received the tithes of Abraham. That's very important, as you'll see when you get the New Testament. This is the only mention in the Old Testament except for the allusion, of course, in Psalm 110. And it's, con it's always contrasted with the Levitical priesthood, which is considered unclean. That's why it always had to have the cleansing, all that stuff. The altars and all the cleansing is to offset the fact that it's, you know, they're unclean. And also it's mortal. It's going to have an end. The separation of priesthood, Levi, and kingship, that's uh, Hebrews 7 really hammers this home. So enough of that. Okay. Um, now, there's, because the writer in Hebrews, the, see, what, the writer in Hebrews makes a point that Melchizedek has no genealogy written and no death recorded. And he's using that as in a rabbinical way to make a rhetorical point. But that has caused some people to speculate 
that maybe was Melchizedek Shem. There are a lot of people that believe he is. I don't believe he is because we know Shem's genealogy. We don't know Melchizedek's genealogy, and that's the point of the writer in the Hebrews. We don't have his genealogy. Was Melchizedek Christ? Some people, some serious scholars, tend to see him as an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. They could turn out to be right, but I personally don't think so. I think Christ's priesthood will be after the order or in the similitude of Melchizedek, is what Hebrews 7 points out. And there's a, that, that's pretty clear. Was Melchizedek a celestial being of some kind? There's people that speculate that way, some kind of, you know, um, Nephilim or something. No, he was a man, according to Hebrews 7. So he, when the writer, you have to understand how the, how the rabbis reason, they'll use an analogy. It doesn't make the analogy, don't, don't, don't carry the analogy in reverse, if you will. Anyway, let's go. he is a type of Christ, though. It's emphasized, this is emphasized by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 7. Because Jesus Christ is also the king of righteousness and peace. Work of righteousness shall be, be peace, according to Romans 14, righteous peace and joy in Colossians 1.20. We, we have made peace through the blood of Christ. We're justified by faith. So then we have peace with God, according to Romans 5.1, and so on. You can find more of those, same thing. There's also an inverse thing here. When you get to Joshua, the, his adversaries align themselves under a leader who calls himself Adonai Zedek, Adonai, the Lord of righteousness. And they are all defeated in the battle of Beth Horon, where the sun stands still and the hailstones, the fire, wipe out the enemies and the kings go and hide themselves in rocks. You need to understand the book of Joshua is a model, an anticipatory model of the book of Revelation. Joshua sends in two witnesses. Uh, they have the seven times around thing with trumpets. And you, it, it, the more you study Joshua and the more you study the book of Revelation, you'll discover one is the outline of the other. And uh, a Yehoshua in the one sense. And... Uh, in each case, forcibly uh, getting rid of the usurpers. In Joshua's case, in the land of Canaan. In the Lord's case, on the planet Earth. And so you can check that out as you go. Let's get on to 1421. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to, your, to thyself. Sodom's offering Abraham a, a, war, a reward here. Give me the persons, but take the goods to yourself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, and I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshkol, Mamre, let them take their portion. So, you know, great victories can lead to great challenges or tests. And this is one of the places Abraham pulled it off right. Gideon didn't do so well. Gideon had his incredible thing, and he took gold, and that caused uh, eventually uh, uh, the, con the son of the concubine killing off his 70 sons and on and on. So uh, often when, after a huge victory is when Satan gets an opportunity. And through pride or covetousness or whatever, this is where we easily can stumble. There's two times you can stumble, when the pressure's really on and also when you're at the top of the heap too. That's when many, many people make their big mistakes, is when everything's going really great. Genesis 15, we'll just wrap this. We have the most important chapter just to finish up here then. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Eliezer of Damascus was his right hand. We'll find that to be very important when we get to chapter 22, excuse me, chapter 24. If Abraham did not have any sons of his own, his entire huge estate would go to this, to Eliezer, who's a neat guy. He's his business partner, but he's not of issue. And so that's what he said. If I go childless, the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. This is the first mention in the Bible of the condition of salvation by faith. 
And this foundational truth is repeated three times in the New Testament, Romans 4, Galatians 3, and James 2. And uh, showing that righteousness is reckoned in return for faith. You can't earn your righteousness. We don't have the capacity. But we can have it counted to us by faith. And that's what God is laying down. Hundreds of details so that it solves God's predicament because he, would, he wants us to be able to fellowship with him. But there's a price to be paid. And we have to accept the price that has been paid. And, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So then God is going to undertake what in those days was the classic ritual for a very serious contract. The word is barat, to cut a covenant. What it, why, it's a strange term. We use it in the Air Force to cut orders because it comes from the old days when had, you know, we had to print through mimeograph machines to print orders. We don't do that that way anymore. They still speak of cutting orders. But the word barat in the Hebrew really comes from this, from this ritual. And God says to him, take me a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Now here's the way this works. See, um, this covenant that we're going to deal with is declared un eternal and unconditional. It's going to be reconfirmed by an oath in chapter 22. It will be confirmed to Isaac and to Jacob in Genesis 26. And when it's confirmed to them, by the way, it'll be under conditions of disobedience. The thing I want to emphasize here, this covenant is going to be eternal and unconditional. It's important to understand that. By the way, the New Testament will de declare it immutable, Hebrews 6. What God tells him to do, he says, he took unto him all these, divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against the other, but the birds he divided he not. And when fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. Now, we could talk a lot about these birds of prey. They were trying to contaminate what's going on, but that was, you know, um, well, I don't, let's not get too, too mystical here. Let's go on. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in good age. God is going to go. Let's see, I, have a, I have a diagram of all of this here. Yeah. This is a divinely ordered ritual. What they used to do in those days, if two people had a really serious contract, they would take an offering and split it into two. In two parts. And then the, 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 two, part, the two people that were covenanting they would walk in a figure eight between these pieces, reciting the terms of their agreement. This is the way they would deal with a covenant of any kind that was, that was you know, adequately serious. Now, the point that goes on here is Abraham is put in a deep sleep. He doesn't walk through the covenant. God goes it alone. What's the point God's trying to make? There aren't any conditions for Abraham to comply to. If he could mess it up, he probably would. Can't mess it up. It's unconditional. Praise God for that. And uh, so that's, that's what's really going on here. Let me go back. I have this. God gives them then this, this, this uh, prophecy. No surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in, the, in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. He's speaking of the Egyptian bondage in advance. And they shall afflict them there 400 years. I'll come back to that number because there seems to be some confusion on that number. And also that nation whom they shall sh serve shall I judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great substance. They not only got out, they came out with great spoil, remember? Thou shalt, thou shalt go into the fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, back to Canaan, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, there's still more sin to be pounded on these guys before God delivers the land from them. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Strange phrase. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So Abraham is in a deep, dark sleep and getting this as a vision, but he sees this, this burning lamp or smoke, whatever, going through where he should be. Call that Shekinah glory, if you like, whatever. But we're getting a little ahead of the game there. So as I say, they... they that was the way they did a ritual. The idea is that God does it alone. He does it, uh, make, proving it's unconditional. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Egypt 
unto the great river of the Jordan, right? Is that what it says? No, my goodness. Under thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Really? When somebody wants to talk about the West Bank, ask them, which river did you have in mind? Obviously, uh, Israel's never reached that boundary. But uh, most of us believe it's the boundary in the, that will be established in the millennium. Then it lists these tribes, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. There are ten nations here. In Exodus 23, they'll be summarized by three. In Exodus 3, they'll be summarized as six. And in the conquest of Joshua in chapter 24, they are summarized by seven. So there's ten in a sense, but three apparently put down. There's seven, and that pattern you'll probably notice comes out of Revelation 13 too. So we'll move on here. The Abrahamic covenant, the commitment of land to his descendants from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. They, are, they were, now here's another thing. You'll find a lot of people make a big thing about that. Is it 400 years or is it 430 years? Because Exodus 12 speaks of 430 years and Acts 7 speaks of 400 years. And God speaks here 400 years. And I'm astonished as I go through commentators, they don't read the text. They sojourned in Egypt 430 years, but it wasn't all under bondage. 30 of that was pretty good time under a Pharaoh that knew Joseph. Then a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph takes over, and they are afflicted for 400 years. If you look carefully at Acts 7, they're afflicted for 400 years. They sojourn in Egypt uh, for 430. There's no conflict while well, they're using round numbers. Yeah, they probably are, but still... Um, uh, and by the way, the pharaoh that knew not Joseph was not Egyptian. Everybody studies this in Egyptology, misses the point. He wasn't Egyptian. That's what Isaiah tells us. He was an Assyrian somehow. Pharaoh Necho wasn't Egyptian either. He was an Ethiopian. That explains the Ark of the Covenant thing. That's what, on it goes. You need to, it's important to do the homework. But they will return with great possession. Three major promises in the Bible. The first is God's covenant with Abraham. In his seed, all nations shall be blessed. That's you and I. God's covenant with the nation Israel is a subject of a separate covenant, and it's conditional. If they served him, they'd prosper. If they forsook him, they would be destroyed. Not wiped out. There's t the terms are different. And then there's also God's covenant with David. His family would produce the Messiah who would reign over God's people forever. There are more covenants, but these are three major promises, major covenants that you want to be sensitive to as we encounter them as we go through the Scripture. And I want to show you something else. As you get into Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30, it's hard to get into Romans 8 and not take the whole chapter. By the way, any time you're feeling down, any time it's sort of everything's a little overwhelming, put a tab in Romans 8 and read the last half. Read the whole chapter, but the last half especially. I have a tab in my Bible so I can make sure that Romans 8, 28 is still there. <laughs> I must check it almost every day to make sure someone hasn't taken but uh, start about verse uh, you know, 20, you know, we know that all things we know. See, the most three, most, three most important letters of that verse is, and we know. We don't suspect or believe. We know that all things work together for good. To everyone know, for them who love God, who are them who are the called according to his purpose. But then it goes on. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Very famous part, and from here on, there's a crescendo. It's hard for me not to go on, but we're running late, so let's go here. There's a basic paradigm here. Predestined, whom he predestined, them he called, whom he called, them he justified, whom he justified, them he glorified. Do you get that from that verse? You with me? How interesting it is, Abraham was predestined, called by God. In Isaac is the seed called, we hear in the scripture. If God can justify Jacob, he can justify any of us. When we get, encounter this character, this conniver called Jacob, and realize that God has justified him, that gives us all confidence. Because if, if God can justify Jacob, we all have a chance at it here. And of course, whom he justified them, he glorified. And Joseph, of course, is an incredible story of God's glory. What's fascinating is you have in Romans 8, verse 30, a summary of the rest of the book of Genesis. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, in specifically in terms of these stages in God's program, 
being exemplified. So be conscious of that as we go. And uh, next time, we're going to take chapter 16, the separation of Hagar, and we'll talk about Ishmael and all the myths that surround that. We'll talk about Genesis 17, where Abram and Sarai have their names changed by adding one letter to their name. And it changes some very, very surprising things. And we'll talk about that, what, what's all in there. Then the Oaks of Mamre, this fascinating event where the Lord and two angels, here is a case where I do believe there's an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. The three of them, these two angels, they come and visit Abram in a fascinating discussion. And that's equally fascinating is there's a passage as Genesis 18 finishes, you almost have to do, do it with a real New York Jewish accent. <laughs> I'm not good at dialects. I really wish I could deliver it the way it should be delivered. It is so funny. It is so, it's a, anyway, we'll get to that. And then, of course, Sodom and Gomorrah, which we'll want to study for a lot of reasons because we are heading in that same direction. And uh, then the lapse at Gerar will finish our primary focus on Abram. We're actually going to try to summarize Abraham in two sessions. And then we'll have a couple of sessions on Isaac with its dramas. And, that, and the, the dramas in, in, in increase as we go. And then Jacob, and then, of course, this incredible time. We'll have, we'll have three sessions with, jo with uh, Joseph. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just praise you for who you are. We thank you, Father, that you have called Abraham and through him have blessed us. We thank you, Father, for the commitment that you've given Abraham and his descendants that have been the shelter for ourselves. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, too, Father, that there are no accidents in your kingdom, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment, too, that we are also called to your purpose. We do pray, Father, that you would, through the blood of Jesus Christ, justify each of us, and through all of that, glorify the one with whom we have to do. We just do pray, Father, you would increase in each of us a passion and a hunger for your word, that you'd help each of us to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Help us to be discerning as we go through these passages to recognize not only their historical validity, but also their spiritual applicability to our own lives. We ask all this, Father, that we might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities before us, that we might be more pleasing in your sight as we commit ourselves this night without any reservation into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.